ask the Lord to speak to you. You have to uh, ask Him to open your heart and mind or you won't be able to receive the Word. Matter of fact, while you're in there asking Him to speak to you, you might ask Him to speak to me so I'll have something to say. <laughs> Shall we pray? <laughs> Lord, we just delightfully bring ourselves before you and we thank you for your tremendous Word. Your Word is absolutely life-changing for us. So come and breathe upon us to be able to receive your instruction from your lips. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. I am going to be waltzing around uh, some thoughts in this session about our relationship with the Lord, our being vessels, becoming vessels of Him, to Him, through Him, by Him, for Him. With that thought in mind, I thought we would begin with Matthew chapter 25 because there's some things that we want to pick up in the text that we'll be using later on, probably doing some digression about and drawing from in our understanding of uh, of scripture. So let's, let's, let's go there. Matthew 25 verse 1. Before I start, it talks about, to beginning with, the kingdom of heaven. That's not the kingdom of heaven and the heavens. It's a kingdom of God that Jesus came to establish here on earth. Because we'll see him talking about people on earth. And he's saying this is what the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God you can translate it either way kingdom of the, the supernatural kingdom dimension of relational functionality in God's presence let's put it that way because Jesus was always preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand and then when he was resurrected the kingdom of God was here kingdom of God is now with us that's why he's referred to as Emmanuel in the scripture God with us he was a man when he first was here, yes, and born of the Holy Spirit and made by the Holy Spirit, a product of the Spirit, a made in the likeness of God himself, a, 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 the, the second Adam made in the perfectness of God. But he was not God. He was a man still, right? But when he was resurrected, now we have a man that has fully, when he rose to the throne, was now enthroned above everything. And I'm not saying he wasn't God at any time. I'm just saying he held different positions. He held the position of a man never calling upon his own authority for a season. But prior to that, he was with the Father. And in, uh, in the beginning, it, it talks about Elohim. It was, he, was, he was there. There was three of them that hovered over the depths of the earth. So the kingdom we're talking about is not one that's distant, but it's one that we're supposed to be established in and walk in and have knowledge of. A real kingdom here in our time with the real king, with him as the authority over it and him directing all the things in our lives if we're a member of his kingdom. So with that in mind, it says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom five of them were wise and five were foolish they were foolish they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them but the wise took oil in their vessels is what the scripture says but they're storing up vessels with their lamps so we've got two different things. We have a lamp. I don't know if you know what a lamp looks like. It's like a squashed teapot. <laughs> it has a little snorkel on one end of it. And there's this, uh, this wick that goes in there made out of cloth. And the reason that they weren't real deep vessels is because uh, if you have a wick hanging off in the deep vessel, this oil was thick. It was not like our thin lamp uh, oil that we have today that will really evaporate and climb up a wick. So it had a problem with gravity. So if you made something deep that held a lot of oil, then the oil itself couldn't go up the wick far because of the gravity. So if you made it wider and broader 
so that it only held this much oil, but a wick was rolled into there. Now we have a, a volume reservoir of oil with the wick in there, and that wick is supposed to draw the oil out, and the oil is supposed to burn, not the wick. I don't know if you know that or not. If the wick burns, it's black. It's smelly. It doesn't, it, it, it'll, it'll burn your eyes. It does, won't smell very good. Can you imagine, I don't know if you've ever smelt wool burn or not. Or have, a, have you ever smelt skin burn? <laughs> it doesn't smell good. So if we're not burning oil and we're burning the wick, then there's something wrong. Now these girls, they didn't have oil. They didn't have oil stored up, the foolish ones. Now, I get real nervous when I read about this. Of course, obviously, the oil represents the Spirit, does it not? Are we all in agreement with that? That in the Word, it clearly shows that the oil is the Spirit. Time after time, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, both for anointing purposes and, and for healing, for, for everything that is done by the Spirit, it's exemplified by two things, either water or the oil, one or the other. And so I, I, I look at the Spirit look, being looked at in those two forms, one that uh, Him being the oil, that's the anointing oil, which if it's applied to leather, if it's applied to our skin, it has healing properties. Two, Him as the water or the wine, also the Spirit's referred to as the wine. Uh, I, the water is what brings forth fruit, is it not? The, the latter the latter rain that is talked about in in scripture is uh, is is referred to as the is the latter pouring out of the Holy Spirit uh, in in the in the last days let me readjust this earpiece we just had a my thing jump off the thing so let's go back to the scripture but the wise took oil in their storing up vessels and with their lamps so they had their lamps too and while the bridegroom tarried they all slumbered and slept and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him now isn't that something even if you're asleep even if you're asleep if you have in some format thought yourself to be the bride of Christ and tried to be that virgin for him the Holy Spirit shows up and there's a voice that cries out that the bridegroom comes it wakes everybody up at the same time then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps now can you see there's ten of them they all get up and they got their lamp and it's midnight and that lamp was like a like a elongated bowl with a snout on it with the with the wick. I liken that to us being the vessel. I think our soul is probably the essence of the wick, because our soul is supposed to be giving praises unto God. It's supposed to be a sweet smelling sacrifice to him. It's supposed to be a clear flame that's burnt before him. And our soul cannot illuminate God out of us without the Holy Spirit in us. You understand that? So the, it, 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 I'm likening the, the lamp that the oil of the Spirit goes in the lamp so that the wick, the essence of our life is just not about Christ. See, when I used to be in the evangelical world, I had a long wick that was sticking out, and I had a lot of knowledge about Christ, and I had a lot of understanding of Him. I, there it is. It's solid. See there? Here, you can light that thing. It's burning, and, and somebody, you know, that knew anything about flames, it, why is it black flame? <laughs> why does that not smell good? <laughs> You know why? Why is there? Why, why is it hurting my eyes? This smoke that's in the room—it's <coughs> choking me. I thought you said it was going to light the room up, and that's kind of what our understanding of trying to express Jesus without the Holy Spirit is. It's us trying to light the light ourselves and burn the light ourselves, rather than letting the Holy Spirit reside within us, 
being filled with the Spirit with the wick in it. Now, as you light that wick, it's saturated with the oil and the fumes, the gassy fumes from the heat are what's burning and the wick itself has no burn marks on it. None. You can look and you'll see the wick and then you'll see uh, a little circle where there's nothing burning and then gas burning around it for, for a beautiful flame. Now, my point in giving us this is because uh, many of us are running around thinking that we're fool, that we're, we have plenty, that we have enough for life of Jesus. Some of us, our tanks are half full, some of it three-quarter full, some of us, our tanks are empty. And you can empty your tank. I, I want you to know you, that God has given you a, a vessel that can hold oil, but you can empty it. Now, there's no evidence that these girls had vessels. It says they didn't. So there's a storing up vessels of carrying oil for the lamps to be prepared to meet Jesus. Now, I think he's giving us a demonstration here for practical purposes of us constantly being prepared and having stores, something stored up. I'll come back to that maybe in a minute if I remember. <laughs> I have a good forgetter. But notice this. Uh, there's seven. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So they got them lit. Okay, I belong to Jesus too. Sure you do. If you've named the name of Christ, you belong to Jesus. But if you're going to try to be his witness, you're going to smoke unless you got the Spirit. When they awoke, they said, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Ah. Lamps can't burn very long if it's not through the Spirit. We can just do Christianity so long out of our own effort. You can. It's impossible for you to do it for long out of your own effort. I grant you, you can do it for some time out of your own effort. But the oil is for a reason. And if we're resistant in getting the oil, negligent in getting the oil. Refuse the state that the oil exists. Eventually you're going to say, well, wait a minute, uh, I don't believe it exists, but can I have some of yours? <laughs> when it comes down to the crisis, and it's time some crisis in your life that you need some light and you try to strike up all you're going to see is just black smoke coming off your wick and you won't get the answers and you won't have the illumination of Jesus leading you through the dark things of this life I see that we're supposed to have a lamp with us all the time I think that lamp probably needs to be tested every once in a while and the way it's tested is in the midst of crisis whether we light the lamp or whether we go out into the world to do our own thing. What happens in the midst of crisis is probably the mark of how we're going to be reacting in life, what we're going to be doing in life. So I would state to you that uh, if you fill up here and you would say you're going to drive to San Francisco or better yet Florida we're in the northwest your tank is full surely you can make it to Florida it's only 3,000 miles but your tank is full that, it, it, you see a problem in the math see that's the problem with our understanding we think we can make it with just the one little tank that we have there has to be stops along the way to pick up fuel or you can do something like I do did we used to have a trailer that we drug across country and even that I had to plan fuel stops there was a diesel truck that got about 20 miles to the gallon and I could hold a hundred gallons of fuel with the extra tanks I had I planned on where I was going to pick up fuel. I didn't let the essence of me running out ever come into play. 
I planned on where I was going to pick up fuel. Now, you can buy fuel in Colorado if you want for four fifty dollar four fifty a gallon or five dollars a gallon. Or if you have enough fuel, you can make it all the way to Rock Springs, Wyoming and maybe but maybe buy it for two fifty a gallon. Now, where do you want to make it to? Now, are you catching some spiritual things out of this, I'm hoping? So we're supposed to store up and we're supposed to have planned resupply because we are using the fuel of God to exist here on earth, are we not? Are we not supposed to be walking in the illumination of the light of the Holy Spirit? Something's being burned if we're going to have light. And if it's going to be clear light, it's going to be lots and lots of the Holy Spirit that's burning. Elsewise, there's lots of smoke and we never get the answers. We pray and pray and pray and we don't get the answers because we are burning the essence of our soul of the knowledge of God rather than the true essence of the Spirit that can illuminate and lead us in this life. Now, I want you to know, I know this scripture has been used to really beat up those who are not filled with the Holy Spirit. I would like you to know there is a statement in here from the Spirit to us. Now when I say us, that includes all of us. If you've received the Spirit, you're going to need more oil, are you not? And if you haven't received the Spirit, you're still going to need oil. So before you get your knickers in a knot, think about this. We're all in the same boat. We're going to need more oil. So the two things that we're going to probably really take a look at is one I need some storing up things to store it up so I bought a special tank for my diesel truck that went under the toolbox that held like 80 gallons of fuel and I think the other tank that was mounted underneath it held like 37 gallons of fuel and I'm thinking about before I stopped doing all the traveling around the country I thought about putting another 60 gallon tank on it <laughs> Why? Because I love storing up so I am prepared. I love storing up so that I can drive and drive and drive and not have to. I can see, yeah, it's six fifty a gallon here in the middle of Utah and, and, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. And I look down and I think, you know, I only have a 120-gallon reserve. This is great. It's not a sweating problem. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been driving along. And the red light come on on the fuel tank. <laughs> and you're sweating bullets. How long is it going to last? Uh, how long? Where's the next town, honey? Look on the map. Oh, I, I, I thought we would make it. I didn't realize we would use that much fuel. Have you ever had the red light come on? Ah, did it change everything to tension. Now we're, oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, oh. And even if you're on the freeway and there's no exit ramp and there's a hundred stations you're passing but you can't exit, <laughs> you're still going, oh, will there ever be an exit? I gotta get fuel. Ah, there's some time in there that there's no peace. There's not any leadership or directives or understanding. There's just the raw understanding. It's going to croak right here in the middle of nowhere. Why didn't I get some fuel? I know that you may not panic like that, but I have a great appreciation for that. Jackie and I were one time driving down the highway up in the middle of mountains in Colorado, and I had this, uh, I had an extra large fuel tank on my van, believe it or not. The thing held 40 gallons of fuel. <laughs> that sounds great, doesn't it? A big van, didn't use much, but it held 40 gallons of fuel. Maybe 36. And I'm driving down the road, and I saw this piece of, I don't know, three-quarter inch pipe fall from, I don't know, some trailer in front of us, went right under my rig, and I guess one of my wheels caught it and threw it and it stuck right into that gas tank. I smell gas and I, uh oh, 
something's wrong i shut the vehicle down and i get out and there's a one inch hole in that gas tank and guess what gas is squirting out of that tank i'm in the middle of mountains i'm in the middle of nowhere yes i got 40 gallons but i don't know how much i got and finally jackie shut the engine down quick <laughs> why because fuel's flooding everywhere underneath the van i stick my finger in the hole <laughs> why i don't know how much is in there but I know we're not going anywhere if I don't figure out how to reserve some of it. Right? I said, Jackie. And I don't remember what I told her to get me out of my, 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 my toolbox. I had one hand stuck in, the, stuck in the hole and the other hand in the toolbox digging around. And I said, okay, go get me that piece of wood uh, you know and I sit there with one hand and I carve out a plug for that hole looking at my finger and then I I'm, and I'm drenched I'm under it I, it's all over me I'm willing to take the rest because I know we're not going anywhere it's at least 60 miles to a station from here it's up and downhill and I'm going to have a hard time pushing on flatland I'm sure not going to be pushing up no hill so reasoning is overtaking me here. I get the plug finally carved out, and I, I quickly pull out my finger and jam that thing in it. And I, uh, 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 won't go, won't go. Oh, how much more fuel do I lose? Finger back in the hole. <laughs> more carving on the stick until it finally it sticks. And I drive that puppy up in there, and you can see it still drip, 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 drip. I drive it more. In, but it left a hole that was kind of, it wasn't perfectly round. So I drive that peg in there to help make it round. And needless to say, praise God, we had enough fuel that we made it back to Farmington, New Mexico, I think, or somewhere coming come down out of the mountains. The point is, I was full of gas. But there are accidents that happen along the way that somehow expend fuel, which still brings us back to needing of a vessel, the needing of a lamp, needing something to light it with, knowing when not to light it. <laughs> see, I wasn't going to ask Jackie to hand me a cigarette lighter so I could see in the dark. <laughs> I would have seen for about two seconds. <laughs> and she would have too. She'd have been close by. But look at this. In, in verse 9, it says, But the wise answered. Who's answering? The wise. Wisdom comes from where? The Holy Spirit. And here's what they said. Not so, lest there not be enough for us. Now, we know that. All those stingy, stingy women. And of course, this is talking about us as the brides and inclusive of men. But then the Holy Spirit speaks. But go ye, rather, to them that sell and buy for yourselves. I think so many times we look at all the rest of this, and oh, we don't want to be caught without. But we're not going and buying. We're not going to the place where it is sold to get it. We're not building up a supply for when times that we need it. If you don't have it built up, you won't have it. It must be built up for you. Now, there's a way that oil can be built up, and I, that's going to be our topic and where we're actually heading, is, is how to get in a position to manufacture oil you want to know that or where do you buy it who sells it because that's a command if you boil all this down it's telling us go ye rather to them so there's a source that sell and buy for yourselves there's a directive from the holy spirit that most christians don't follow they look down at the gas tank no i got plenty i don't need to go buy any no i was filled with the spirit once i don't need to go buy any i don't associate with those who sell the oil they don't know where to get the oil because they don't need the oil. Now, I think that person's worse off than the one that's just got the empty lamp with the wick because they've got an essence and understand what oil is supposed to be about, but yet there is no finality in their mind and understanding, oh, my goodness, I need to store up all of this precious commodity that I can store up. So we'll leave that one alone for a moment and go on here. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 18. Here's my servant, servant whom I have chosen, the one I love. 
and whom I delight, and I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations, or to the Gentiles, because nations is the same thing. He'll not quarrel or cry out. I love that little statement, because if we're supposed to be modeled after Jesus, most of the time we grumble and complain, especially when we get into situations that are not to our liking. We want to quarrel. We want to cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. Praise God. Jesus, do you realize he carried the cross that whole way without complaining or murmuring once? He would have been disqualified if he had even murmured once. If he had complained once while carrying the cross. A bruised reed he will not break. Now, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Who's the reed? That's me and you. That means we're not a tree, we're flimsy. <laughs> we, we swing back and to, it forth in the wind, and I don't know if you've ever seen a reed and you bend it over. It doesn't break. It just kind of mushes out, and, but it still grows, and it's still a part of the reed pack, you know. Then he makes this odd statement. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. till he leads justice to victory. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And praise God, that's the whole theme of what that verse has to say. If you're just a smoldering wick, his aim is not to snuff you out. Matter of fact, it, when he says that uh, he... he Till he leads justice to victory. What is he talking about? Until, see that word justice is the same thing. Until he has high court to lead you into victory. Until he can make some judgments to where you and I can see his judgments. Of, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to have oil with me. It's the same terminology of saying until he holds a high court where you can see all the evidence and you can get into victory. Now, in his high court, he throws the gavel down and he says, You need my word. He says, Oh, yes, Lord, I'll, I'll go read this and I'll read that. And he says, You need my Holy Spirit. Well, uh, didn't I get that thing? Uh, see, if you don't know what that is, and you think you know, there's a problem. High court settles the issue. Witnesses are brought in about what Jesus did, what our responsibilities are, what we're supposed to do before him, how our actions are supposed to do, the provisions of God, the formality of the court, and that we must receive Jesus. Can you imagine this? Jesus looking at a cup of every filthy, vile thing I am and you have ever been and every other filthy sinner on the face of the earth to the last murderer. And he says, oh God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Strike two. I ask you, God must have spoke to him because three times he interceded, is there, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. There was no other way. Jesus drank the cup and became the fullness of every vile thing that I am or will be. There was no other way. He had to fully take upon himself my identity. And in taking my identity, God looked upon him and spit upon him. Whipped him unmerciful. Why? Because he represents the rebellious me. And if there were any other way, Jesus would have taken it. God would have supplied it. But if there was only one way for him, isn't there only one way for us? get ourselves in that cup before him that he can drink it it's called the covenant between you and him and the last supper covenant of drinking that covenant now that's not the discourse of this study but it is good valuable information think of that there is no other way for you except you enter covenant with him because there was no other way for him 
and lest him lest he takes you in himself he fully became you now before we belabor that too much let's go back to the smoldering wick see that's someone that doesn't even have any gas in the tank they just got a wick so how much gas does your tank have in it is it half full because it takes fuel to run your course in this race that's laid out of life it takes lighting that light sometime at midnight Lord is that you it, and how many times have you had midnight I meet many people that call themselves Christians but when your testing comes and oh how horrific that testing can be what will you do Will you have a lamp that you can light? I recall a man and his wife that were Christian brothers and sisters. Had probably one of the greatest testings I've ever seen. The man was in the habit of getting up at crack of dawn and running out, and he parked his big truck in his driveway. Work truck. Dump truck. And he had a little four-year-old son that he had bought a new tricycle the day before. His little four-year-old son got up before anybody in the family and went out and rode in a tricycle right there at the crack of dawn. The guy didn't know he was out of bed. The guy kinks up that vehicle and backs it down the driveway. And I need not tell you the rest. The weeping and the tears and the hours of darkness. Midnight came upon the man. Midnight came upon the family. And if they hadn't had oil and the lamp, they, must, they may not have survived the moment. They may not have survived in life. Because when you're faced with such horrific things, you need the light of the Spirit. You don't need just the wick of you to burn. Just the wick of you and I will not bring out the essence of the truth of God. Will not bring His mercy. Will not give His compassion. Will not give His understanding. Will not bring the revelation of the Word. So this is no small thing. You may not have been tested to this degree yet, but you probably will be sometime in your life. And if your oil is not in your lamp and you don't have extra oil, it will not light. It will go out in that dark, dark hour. Why? Because you need to be able to call upon Jesus. You need to be able to scream your head off with the light burning. Lord Jesus, I need you now. Oh God, I need you. And you need that light to burn steady where Jesus Christ can show up in fullness. Why? Because you're his bride. You've got the oil and the lamp burning. He sees the lamp from afar. From the heavens, he looks down and says, Oh, my bride is in need. She has lit her lamp. The Spirit cries out. The Spirit cries out to me. Do you think he would not show up? But if you have not the oil, there's a problem in River Sea. Here's one of the problems. Thing to do when you're empty first of all you need truth unless God's going to do a miracle for you and he says I'm going to put gas in your gas tank you need truth we don't want truth we don't like truth I mean you know I, 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 I was coming down the stairs no, I was going up the stairs, and my brother Tristan was sitting over in the far corner, and I, I went real slow, you know. I, was, I just got up from the computer room back there, and I, I was going up the stairs, and I was kind of half asleep and just dragging bottom. And uh, he popped up and said, You know, they say you can get real healthy going up and down stairs a lot. Okay. Thanks, I, I needed that, Tristan. <laughs> Did he tell me a truth? He did. He did. Did he tell me a truth I wanted to hear? No. We don't like hearing real truth. I, I would especially get nervous if, 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 if I'm in our dressing area and somehow Jackie looks over and the scale's laying on the floor and she looks, have you weighed yourself lately? 
I think, no, and I don't want to. <laughs> she doesn't do that. Why? I don't want to hear that truth from her. I can't handle the truth. I don't want the truth. And there's part of the fuel, part of the oil. If we want the oil, the oil is pure truth. I'm the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. You can't reject part of it and expect the other part to come. The two truths are attached. If I'm going to be led by the Spirit, which is truth, if I want truth in my hour of darkness, I cannot be in the position to have been rejecting truth. Revelation 3.17 Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold tried in the fire. Now remember we read about the, the bride up there it says go ye rather to them that sell oh we just found out who sells Jesus sells what are you about to buy with not much what do you got to buy with there's supposed to be an exchange your nature for his your rags for his clothes. Your poverty for his riches. Your mind for his mind. Your life for his life. The only thing you got to sell is your right to your life. The only thing you got to sell is yourself into slavery with God or slavery to the world. That's it. He says you're already blind. You think you're rich. You think you got it all. You think, you think the tank is full. But the day of darkness is coming. You're going to go behind some truck and somebody's going to be there. The day is coming. And when that comes, if your lamp is not full, you will not be able to withstand. A little cork will go off in your head and you'll blow your top and Satan will grab your mind and you will not recover from it. Oil has to be in there. Why do you think we need so many psycho babblers out there? Because they didn't turn people to Jesus. They didn't turn them to the oil. They just rather, here, take these 16 different drugs and you won't know who you are. You won't have so many problems. <laughs> problem is, every one of those 16 people they want you to become has greater problems than the one person that was there before he went in. <laughs> but our Jesus, he says, you come to me. You buy from me. I'll sell you gold. And that gold will be tried in the fire. That thou mayst be rich. And white raiment that thou mayst be clothed. That thy shame and thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy salve. That thou mayst seest. And may as I love. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold. I stand at the door rephrase that behold I stand at your door the door of your heart the door of your life the door of your mind I stand at the door and knock and if you hear my voice if any man hears my voice and open the door I will come in and he will sup with me And I with him. Our God not only offers to give us gold. He offers to give us a point blank encounter with him in person. But there must be a recognition of the lack that we have in our souls in order for that to take place. Zechariah 18. Excuse me. Zechariah 8 and 18. Again, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. And this is what the Lord Almighty says. The fast of the fourth, the fifth, and the seventh, and the tenth months, that's seasons, will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Now, what does that have to do with fried eggs and ham? Where it comes in is, is it... 
The spirit is the spirit of truth, spirit of wisdom. Is this talking about specific fasts that were set aside in different seasons to produce truth and peace? Truth, the essence of the Holy Spirit. There are seasons designed so we might break through into truth. Did you know that's why seasons are given? We look at seasons as something terrible. Oh, no. You know, winter's coming. Oh, or I'm in winter and I don't ski. <laughs> you know, I, 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 don't, I don't get this thing about winter. I mean, I lived in Texas and I just all my life in the south. Oh, I wish I was in the mountain where there was 800 feet of snow. Now, people from the mountains where there's 800 feet of snow. Oh, I wish I was in Texas where it was warm and there was a beach. <laughs> Part of our understanding about oil is related directly to seasons. Oil is not something you can just go out and get and produce. It's something that God produces through a series of events and seasons. And we don't want to go through the seasons. And if, because we don't want to go through the seasons, we don't get the oil. We're not going to Him who sets the seasons and can set a season in your life that can produce some oil. In Genesis 1.14, And God said, Let there be a light in the expanses of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs and marks and seasons and days for the years. Now, what He's saying there is that He has made seasons. Why? There's, there's, there's a reason. In fact, Genesis 8 and 22, As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Now, why? Did he just want to punish us? You know, in the spring, okay, there's a, okay, we can just expect flood. Winter, okay, snow, another miserable time. Summer, oh, 110, I know it's coming. Fall, oh, we're going to freeze to death and have an early freeze, and it's just going to be terrible. We hate seasons. We don't like change. So let's look at the four seasons that he gave us and the reason behind them in Scripture. 1 Kings 6 and 37. The foundation of the temple of the Lord was laid in the fourth year in the month of Ziv, a spring. There's a reason why God chose that his temple would be built beginning in spring says that the foundation was laid there. And then in the eleventh year, in the month of bull, and that's no bull, that's the eighth month, that's November, for those of you. The temple was finished in all its details according to specifications he had spent seven years building. Notice, it's built, it was finished in November. You know when November is? Winter. That's the reason it's finished in winter. When you can stand in the winter of your life and be godlike in your characteristics, godlike in your attitudes, godlike in your actions, filled with God's purpose in the winters of your life, then God will look and say, It has been built according to the specifications. There's the problem. We don't stand in the winter, we crumble, we whine, we complain. Oh, it's winter. I don't like winter. <laughs> So let's examine spring a little bit more here. God is the one that set forth spring. What's supposed to happen in that season for us? It's a time for making all things new. Genesis 1.11. God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, so forth and so on. It's a season for smelling the roses and singing. It's a season that you have head-on encounters with Jesus, head-on encounters with the Holy Spirit, where freshness comes over you, new zeal comes over you. It's a season that He gives you new plants. It's a season for new things. It has purpose for growth, and it has all kinds of auxiliating things. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and beginning of verse 10, My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come to me. Spring. That's the first sign of spring, when the Lord beckoned you to Himself. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Now, we can appreciate that here in the Northwest, can't we? Flowers appear on the earth. 
Oh, something, something beautiful. When you're coming out of just drizzle and, and rain and, and, and misery. Oh, look at that field of flowers. Something made the field of flowers, and we'll get to that. That occurred as a result of winter, which that'll be our last thing that we look at here. A season of singing has come. Our seasons in your relationship with God that just joy overwhelms you, singing of the heart and connecting to God of, oh God, you're real. The heart leaps and sings for joy at His presence. The cooing of the doves is heard in our land. Uh, anybody know what that means? <laughs> Who represents the dove? Who descended upon Jesus? Ah, the Holy Spirit now. We need the Holy Spirit in the land. We need to hear his coos and woos of drawing us. It's the first sign that we're in spring. And springs can be wonderful. Can be. Should be. And if you have one right, it's most delightful. It is. But it's not harvest time. There's nothing there to store up. There's no oil there. It's just the beginning of the promise and hope of what will come. The fig tree forms its early fruit. That's the first fruits of the Spirit. So you can just have a little taste. And I just love it that it's the fig tree. The Lord reminds you, what did Adam cover himself with? <laughs> He hid behind a fig tree. <laughs> he hid behind the leaves. And now God wants to bring you the fruit of what it's like to have real life in Him and not hide behind the tree or the essence of life or the essence of work or the essence of who you think you can be in this world. And the blossoms of vines spread their fragrance. My goodness, I don't know if you've been around when vineyards are in bloom you've been down to California and you've been in wine country and thousands of acres and rows of walking aimlessly in the blossoms. I remember as a kid walking through orchards of orange trees and the orange blossoms. When the blossoms is there, it's just heavenly. So spring has all kinds of experiences of the hope of the fruit that we are supposed to be able to produce in the future. It's supposed to produce a zeal and a hope and a longing for what God has in store for us, that there is bountiful spiritual harvest. There is bountiful great things in the land that are going to take place. But it's not hanging there right now. There's a blossom there, isn't there? We love springs because they're a sign of that. And the final thing that happens in spring, which is the first thing, arise Come, my darling, my beautiful one, come to me. There's a very special time of the Spirit's calling. And if we answer His call, He'll plant new seeds and new deposits within us that will bring newness and freshness. If we do not come immediately when He says come, we miss those seeds and we miss the purpose of spring taking place because now, we, since we didn't come to Him when He called us, since we didn't receive more of Him when He called us, we're not getting the seeds put in us so when the harvest time comes, there's nothing to harvest. So spring is very important. It's time that God calls. And if He calls, you better not be doing anything else but answering and saying, Yes, Lord, I am here. I am your beloved. Nothing else matters. Nothing else is important as receiving the seeds needed to produce a harvest. Spring is also another time. 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, they destroy, they destroy the Ammonites and the besieged Raboth. Ah, oh, spring can be a time where God adds such vigor to you spiritually that areas that the enemy is close to you in, you can finally conquer and push him back. 
when you're so basking in the presence of the Lord and there's so much of him there, you're strengthened. And finally, you can go down to Raboth and besiege it. I am not leaving until this thing is conquered. And he provides all the resources for you to do that. Why? Because he's there. Why? Because you came. He called you. Why? Because he wants the Amorite in us out. And he'll strengthen you to corner the Amorites in you to defeat them that happens in the spring that's when God's people are supposed to make war against the enemy because the strengthening occurs because our great king is in our midst we're not supposed to make war in the summer we're not supposed to make war in the fall the enemy makes war in the winter we're supposed to make war in the spring why because the freshness the great power of our king is there beside us. Going on in scriptures, Proverbs 6 and 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Two different times are mentioned there. Summer. What's going on? There's a store of provision. Stores of provision aren't necessarily the harvest. Stores of provision are everything that you... What, what do you need? You need vessels to store stuff in. you got to get a pot-making machine and build some pots. you you got to build what you're going to need to break out and harvest the grain. you got to build something to put the grain in. It's the time of getting ready for the harvest. And he's saying, look at the ant. Because there's no need of you going out and, and getting the oil and crushing the oil if you've got nothing to put it in. So summertime, uh, summertime's a good time. But it's also one that God's breath comes in. Summertime, God comes close. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Now, I don't know if you've been in miserable Texas in August when it's 110 degrees and high humidity. I mean, a drop of sweat running down your back, you can't even feel it. It does not evaporate. The humidity is so bad that you can taste it on your tongue and almost drown in the air. And if you've been there, you know that. And if you haven't experienced it, you haven't experience misery <laughs> my whole point in giving you this is God's hand when it comes heavy upon us that's the summertime and we need his hand I want his hand upon me I want it to be heavy enough and the heat to be up enough that I turn to him why because I have another chance of purification why because he talks about this vessel if it's purged and fit for the master's use, what it can accomplish. But the problem is the vessel has all kinds of other things in it. In order to get the things out of it, I mean, if you got a, a, a whole bunch of ants living in one of your jars, all you got to do is just go out and leave it in that sun that's when it's 110 degrees. It's going to get 160 inside, and whatever's in there is coming out. <laughs> and the same way within us. Inside, there's many impurities within me that keep me from being a vessel of the Holy Spirit because I have other purposes. And the heat of God's hand, when it comes upon me in the summertime, make sure to turn up the heat high enough that I purge myself of those things that would prevent me from receiving and preparing to be able to receive the harvest. So there's a preparation of a storing up vessels for the harvest. You have the scripture there. That's another thing that summer is for. Jeremiah 40 and 10. Because at the end of that hot summer, there's a harvest of wine and summer fruit, oil, and put them in your jars. Let me read that again. Jeremiah 40 and 10. But you are to harvest the wine, the summer fruit, and the oil, and put them in storage 
jars and live in the towns you have taken over. You can't live in the towns unless you can do the harvest. You can't do the harvest unless there was a spring for the seed. But in the summertime, that's when you get ready. At the end of summer, that's when you harvest. And you put it in your storage jars. Now we have fall. Fall is a special time of the outpouring of rain to build up the water table of our lives and prepare the seed to sprout. Most of us don't like fall because we look and see, oh, we've had such a, a great time in spring, so many promises we heard. And then there's this dry, hot summer. And then, oh, wow, we had this bountiful harvest. Oh, harvest times are just so great. I love harvest time. Well, there was a lot of heat in between there before you got the fruit, <laughs> before you got the oil. But the heat produced the fruit. The heat produced the oil. The sun and the rays that it was exposed to caused fruitfulness. But long before that took place, there was a preparation. And fall is a beginning preparation for the next season, for a whole year away. A whole year. In fall, in the Texas area, that's when we start getting our rains. And boy, I'm telling you, if they don't get their rains in the fall... Come the following summer. I remember flying over Texas one time. It's just covered with hundreds of thousands of man-made ponds and lakes. 1980, we had over 90-something days. It was over 110 degrees. Had over 100-something days, 130 days. It was over 100 degrees. I flew over Texas, and all the glistening lakes that used to be there were gone. Why? Because we didn't have any rain the fall before. And we didn't have any rain during the winter. We usually get rain then, too. Now, we live up here in the northwest, and I find it rather odd. The rivers are full. The ocean's chuck plum full of water. But I hear people saying, you know, we're not receiving the rain. What's going to happen? The mountains have no snow. I look up there, I see snow. I see snow. What they call snow and I call snow is not the same. I mean, I, I come from Texas and you get two inches of snow. That's snow. I mean, uh, Mount Baker up here, I think, gets 200 feet of snow, not 200 inches, 200 feet a year. And that 200 feet solidifies into constant springs and streams and groundwater tables that cause the crops to grow down here in this valley. You dry those springs up and the water table dries up down here. There is no irrigation for them to draw from if the water table dries up. Every once in a while, my mother have about a three-year drought down there and her well almost choke and not give water. Many people's wells just give out. Why? Because the table water is gone. There has to be a saturation of that. And with the saturation in the fall... And the continued saturation through the winter, something begins to take place. He says in Deuteronomy in chapter 11, verses 14 15, Then I will send the rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rain, so that you may gather in your grain. Now what are the autumn and the spring rains for? So you may gather your grain later on. Now I'm telling you, I'm like you. I'm all in this. I don't like winter. <laughs> used to but I've got to the point now I like winter I like snow I like rain rain are the things I didn't anticipate and didn't expect and didn't want but when that happens I get on my face to my God and it causes me to pray it causes me to seek him out matter of fact a winter time that comes listen to this winter in first kings when the heavens are shut up, there's winter, and no rain, don't you want to know why? Or do you want to walk ignorantly? Say, well, looks like another drop. We'll be okay. Your people have sinned against you. And when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin, because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people, Israel. Teach them the right way to live 
and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. In the wintertime, the enemy makes war against us. 1 Kings 8 and 35. When famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers. Now, does that sound like your life? Just pick out the different events that have taken place over the course of the last five years. What's taken place in there? You know, what, what has been eaten up? How about your employment? How about your finances? How about your health? How about your relationships with your family? How about the working out of your future? How about the hope of your retirement? How about your children? Is there anything in there that you understand that is connected to these grasshopper and bug things that are in here? That means the enemy is at work. Destroying and devouring the crop that God wants to send us. So that's what a winter is. When that begins to take place, the enemy attacks. But in the midst of attack, if we are with God, none of these things will touch us. But if we're not with God and we've built our own house, we've farmed our own land, we've tried to do our own thing for our own success, then famine and plague comes to the land, blight and mildew, locusts and grasshopper. And when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when, after he says all these things take place, when you see these things take, if they're taking place, if they've been taking place, if your life has been a disaster zone at any time in the near, future, near past, then this is what you're supposed to do. And when a prayer or plea is made by any of your people, Israel, with each one aware of the afflictions of his own heart. In other words, you're aware, oh God, I'm like this, and it's causing that. What's being withheld? The rain. What's going to be needed a full year away from now? The essence of what that rain would produce. So winter plays its, it plays its role to bring the rain. And when you don't see it coming, because of something you've done, there's time to change that. There's time to fix that before you're gone. But you must become aware of the afflictions of your own heart. Now, there's the truth. I don't want to face the truth about me. Many people don't want to face the truth that they're slanderers about everyone else. Many people don't want to face the truth that they can't control their tongue. They have to talk, 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 talk. I mean, you get in the room with some people that want to talk, they talk you to death and think, my goodness, I, I, don't you going to let me say hello? <laughs> you know, you get in somebody in the room that's just plum sour, they occupy. Somebody that's just pure fill of, filled with anger, they occupy the room. Well, there has to be a reality of truth. If I'm going to call myself a Christian, if I'm going to walk with God, if I want rain to come, I must see my words, my actions, my deeds, my thoughts are not right before my God. I need truth. Now, if you come and tell me, you know, you talk too much. What? Well, I don't want your truth. You know, you just have a bad attitude. What? I don't have a bad attitude. Well, I worship God every morning. I don't want your truth. We must be able to receive the truth of the state of our soul. If we can't receive that truth, we cannot receive the oil that goes in the jars. Because the two go together. Pray that you can receive truth. As he goes on to say in verse 14, let our officials, I changed notes here. Let him spread out his hands towards the temple. Then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and act. This is what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to spread his hands out. Oh God, here's the state of my soul. I've been lying to myself. And he will hear from heaven, his dwelling place, and he will act. And then it says he will deal with each man according to what he does. Now, we don't want God to deal with us. We want to be Christian Houdinis and escape from it. We do, Oh, just forgive it. I don't have to pay for it. Oh, Jesus, it's under the blood. It's forgiven. No, God wants to deal with your nature. It's winter time. You can change your nature because unless you change your nature, you're a vessel that's broken and can hold nothing. 
You've only dug a hole in the ground that's filled with sand. That if you put something in it, it just runs right out. We have to be willing to be dealt with by God about our nasty nature. If we're not willing to be dealt with it, He can't put anything in us. And we can't be a holder of the wine that is to come or the oil that is to come. So we need God's dealings. We need to pray, Oh, God, help me deal with me. That's where you give Him invitation to give you correction. Most of us don't want the correction. We just want the forgiveness. But there's never any change unless there's correction. I mean, if you've got children, then, oh, you know, I, I know my hand was in the cookie jar. You know, pay no attention to that. Please forgive me. Come on, tell me. You forgive me. Tell me. Tell me. Is that, what, is that the way you're going to deal with your child? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> not only that, <laughs> wrong attitude. You're not supposed to hand your hand in the cookie jar. And forgiveness has nothing to do with that. You need to be dealt with. So you don't stick your hand back in that cookie jar until I say. I mean, after all, God got the cookies for us, didn't he? He knows when he was supposed to give them to us so that we don't hurt ourselves. Because we can be just flat cookie monsters in this life. Going on in the scripture. We have to become a sponsor of winter events. I want to sponsor winter. Why? Because it can do some marvelous things within me. The people of God are supposed to set themselves aside in purity to God. But when they return to the land, I'm talking to be giving you some scripture in Ezra, they returned to the land in the book of Ezra, and they made some discoveries. And when did they return? They were they were they were working on the temple. They went to work on the temple and they made a discovery about themselves. Truth got put on the table. They were supposed to have been a pure race before God, not intermarry with any of the outsiders. When I look at that statement of fact. I realize my heart is intermarried with the prostitutes of this world, the things of this world. I desire the things of this world, the purposes and actions of this world. So when they returned, they found out some things about themselves. In Ezra 10 and 12, they made a decision. that All of a sudden, it came to them. They found this in the Word, that the priesthood if it was polluted and they wanted to give sacrifice in order to bring God's presence back into the state of Israel, God's real presence, His real presence, could be maintained through sacrifice of the pure priesthood. What did they discover? Priesthood was polluted. Every last family, the priesthood had been polluted. There was therefore no one to officiate a real sacrifice that could be accepted before God where God would come and bless the nation again. Do you understand the ramifications of that? A real God not coming. And they realized, oh, my goodness, we're back in the land, but God will never come because of the state of our souls. We took these things on. What were we thinking? So God gives them a way out to become pure again. All the people come together. They're standing in the rain, bawling for days. When they find this in Scripture, that they have done this and there's no one pure left to bring God's presence. They're standing in the rain in the winter. They've come from a land been set free, had hopes of, oh, God, we'll be able to walk with you. We'll be able to see your presence, your Shekinah presence will come, and we will be your people, and oh, it will be a wonderful day. And now winter comes over their souls. No, I cannot come. I will not come. You're unfit. You have breached the contract. So they've been standing outside, bawling in the rain for days. But there were many people here, 
and in this winter it is the rainy season winter so we can't stand outside we're just standing there not knowing what to do the whole purpose of us coming is to be able to be in God's presence and to find out that we're defiled and he won't come I would stand there and bawl too in the rain wisdom comes in from the spirit besides this matter cannot be taken care of in just a day or two See, there's the problem we want to just say Jesus forgive me and it's all taken care of instead of us really recognizing the state of the impurity of our souls that would not enable God's presence to come we should be heartbroken over that but God comes in and he gives wisdom as to what to do he gives wisdom this is not a light matter you're not going to settle this or change this in one or two days come inside stop standing in the rain rule number one when it's winter don't stand in the rain come where, where are we supposed to come inside where he's at Jesus has made a way to sanctify you so at least you can stand inside you're not drenched in rain where some senses can turn back on and we may be defiled but if we just come inside with him and begin to cry out to him then we let this matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two because we have sinned greatly in this thing let our officials act for the whole assembly we don't know what else to do there should be the officials of God's presence to be able to turn to there should be some officiators of his presence to be able to turn to for them to make a way of change for them to seek God and find what can be done about this what changes need then let everyone in our town who has married a foreign woman come at a set time now if you've been married to foreign things in this life you need to make arrangements to come at a set time so we can talk about those things isn't that what you're getting in that along with the elders and judges of each town until the fierce anger of our God in this matter is turned away from us so the exiles did as we proposed Ezra the priest selected men who were family heads one from each family division all of them designated by name get this on the first day of the tenth month that's the beginning of winter they sat down to investigate the case and by the first day of the first month they had finished dealing with all men who had married foreign women three months of winter of dealing with what's inside three months of letting God judge those things three months to freedom freedom wasn't in the spring freedom wasn't in the summer freedom wasn't in the fall the setting free takes place in the winter it goes I've given you a complete list there all the priesthood the following had married foreign women I'm not going to read you all the names can you imagine the actual priesthood is supposed to have the ability to stand in God's presence the actual priesthood that God had Moses lay hands upon and God himself passed a blessing to them saying if this blessing comes off your lips with your hands upon these people this blessing will overtake them a supernatural anointing lost and defiled but now God makes the way the descendants of all these different priesthoods had lost their ability. Even among the, 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 the Levites. I, I, I want you to know, even the singers were involved in this. The gatekeepers were involved in this. So the reason I put those things in there so you can see, it, it, it came in upon every functionality of the priesthood so that it could prevent God's presence from coming. They dealt with it. the men came forth and swore an oath before God and all these foreign women with their foreign children they put away and divorced and sent them away can you imagine the tears 
That's tough. But you got to desire God more than you desire this life. See, there are things we have birthed in this world that we're attached to. We've got all kinds of little God children of things. Children of our hopes. Children, all kinds of offspring that's, that's intermixed with the world. And if we're going to be that pure vessel that receives the rain. See, these men, this nation, was needing that rain of the winter in order for the crops to be produced for the spring. I don't know if you know this or not. As soon as the snow melts, you see green grass, don't you? It's not dead grass. It's green grass. Grain sprouts up. As soon as the snow melts, you see leaves come upon the trees and spring is upon us. All seeds have been laying in that, not just a dormant state, that rough exterior of the hall has been so saturated with rain for months on end, it has finally softened and can open and blossom and bloom. The things of God that the Spirit plants within you has to break out of this outer shell that is hardened. And the only way this outer shell can be softened is for the rain to continually be on it all the way from the autumn through the fall through the winter through the spring it took that long for that seed to be set free and once it's set free now we're back in regular time again it's spring spring just didn't happen spring happened because of winter if you're in the winter of your life and challenged rejoice because you can see your God. You can hear your God. You can be led by your God. You're being set free from things that will prevent seeds from being planted for your future harvest. And what's in the future harvest? All your provision, all your health, all the whole leadership of life. Everything about life that there is is in that future harvest. And it all begins to take place in our winters. So before you make decisions of what you're going to do to get out of the winter of your life, See if you can find your God in the midst of it and say, Deal with me, O God. I don't want to escape. Don't let me escape. Deal with my nature. Deal with me. Make it hard upon me so that I can leave me here so that I can receive more seeds of you for the harvest of my future. The reason I've given you all four seasons is because all four seasons has to do with the production of oil. We find... For the most part, we just want to run and get the oil. We don't understand we need winter to produce it. We need spring to produce it. We need the heat of the summer to produce it. We have to go through seasons. And the seasons will produce the oil and essence of the Spirit in our life. That when we come to winters, our great God stands with us. Our great God is there. When it comes to summers, our great God is there. When it comes to spring, we dance with Him. When it comes to the summers, we rejoice with Him. When it comes to the winters, I cozy up next to the fire with Him and say, My God, all things are in Your hands. I'm here for a cup of cocoa with You. I fear them not because You are my God. When winter becomes something desired as a result of what God can do in us, our lives will change. Winter is the mark of finishing the great work of God within you, of you being able to walk with Him with joy, with zeal, with hope, without fear, knowing God's hand is going to produce a harvest in your winter. Shall we pray? Lord, I'm almost overwhelmed with the thought of what you can do in my winters. In my immaturity, I like spring because it's not hot. 
and you don't have to work <laughs> you just watch things bloom <laughs> I like to see the harvest and so many of us cry out for harvest but what we don't understand is the principle of storing up is based upon the principle of winter so whatever state that we need to be in. If we need new experiences of spring, then we ask you to set them, for you said you set the seasons. If we need new experiences of the summer, then send those. If we need new experiences of the rains of winter, and I say, Lord, send it. For it too is the sole source of all that will take place in the summer and spring. I not only submit to it, but I request it. I say, oh Lord, send these seasons in our lives so that we can walk with you in them all, through them all. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 If you have a uh, comment about this, I think we'll go with the comments instead of prayers this time. No, let, 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 let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. How about that? No? Let's do comments. Let's do comments. Let's do comments. Yeah, it's comments instead of prayer. How did the Lord speak to you in the midst of this message? Remember, this is not about last week, last month, another message, or another day, or another hour. If Jesus has been speaking to you in the midst of His mighty word, what did he speak to you? And how would you like to make proclamation of that? I remind you, before you reach the top of the stairs, you will forget. If you want to make proclamation. Yes, Pat. I'm, I'm no giant, I don't think we have your microphone on. Just talk in it until you hear yourself. Go check, check, check. Check, check, check. There we go. Okay. <coughs> Um, I, I'm no spiritual giant or anything, but I can see I, I want this chastisement. I want, I know I need change. And I mean, we're always asking for, I'm always asking, change me, oh God. And so I'm asking for this chastisement right now. I, <laughs> I don't know. I need it. <laughs> Brother. I don't want to miss his presence. I don't want, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I don't, you know. I'm there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> My brother, you are in the winter of your life, and you have done well. You will see a spring. Yes. I'm just glad to be here by His grace tonight, and it's exactly what I needed to hear um, because I'd have to say that uh, I'm pretty good at running the race according to my own will, and I'm, I'm tired of that. And I just thank God that he's given me provision tonight by his grace and his mercy to, uh, I need to learn how to embrace the four seasons. Um, you know, it's real good when things are good, but you know, it's through those testings, it's through the fires that I'm really, that's where I'm getting mostly blessed. It's in the midst of my weakness that he's strong. And um, I want less of me and more of him. And I want to learn how to embrace all the seasons because without all four seasons, I won't be purified. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? quickly now if you people listening out there have any comment you can put it on the chat line and Tristan will read it to us back there yes Carol I've got a lot of thoughts going through my mind about this it was a wonderful message and um, I can see in reflecting and hearing what you've said about times that I've gone through certain seasons and I have not made the best use of those. I'm <coughs> sure, you know, and um, but I um, I want to do so, and I I had um, really uh, enjoyed the the your explanation of the 
the ten virgins and the the wine and how how all of that um, came, uh, what came out of that it was it was really wonderful and I don't know I I know there's a lot more that I'm <laughs> I could say but I can't think of um, just how to put it so it'll have to cook for a while I guess praise God anyone else quickly now you'll be thinking. Sometimes it's very difficult for me to know what season I'm in, but I I believe I've been in a winter time when everything's been shut down. And it's a very strange season for me, and yet it's been a uh, rather glorious season. Um, I I have a sensing of hope and anticipation, and, and yet I'm not in a hurry. And uh, I, I, I pray I'm that God will correct me and show me what I need to know in order to take full advantage of the season and to be for him what he wants me to be in this season uh, so that there will be a fruitful harvest in the fall. Amen. Amen. Tonight, I, I agree with Carol. This, is, this has been an excellent message and one that I'll chew on for a long time. <clears throat> um, I, I, tonight, I, I saw that all the dots connected between the seasons, and and it's not that it was it was a new some new concepts to me, but it was it's like it penetrated deep into my spirit. It became a spirit <coughs> message tonight, which I think was was the thrust. <laughs> uh, the the connection between plantings and the rain and storing up. I mean, preparations to store up for the harvest. Uh, that that yeah, you you break the chain there on any one of those, and and you've you basically skipped a whole year. And uh, that, when I thought about that for a moment, um, the import of it really registered with me that these are not light things. If I skip through a period of time, and I'm one who, and Terry can witness to this that. I'm one to quickly ask for forgiveness and move on and, and not do the deep work of why did that happen to begin with? What were the roots that need to be laid, have the ax laid to them so that it doesn't happen? Again, it doesn't become a pattern. And <clears throat> the, 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 the message tonight for me was to take the time in the season to accomplish the work of the season, to get the benefit of the season, in the in the rhythm of the seasons, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. So thank you, Pastor. Got one comment I'd like to make to you as you're passing the microphone. If you're from Australia, your springtime is different than mine. And just because it's your springtime, don't come and holler in my face and say. Well, I'm believing God. God's beside me. And I got rain over my head. I'm in a different season. And that's something Christians don't often recognize. People who are in winter don't expect those in spring to join you. It's not right. Each person God sets the seasons for. And we should not be so directive and let me tell you how to get out of your winter and let me tell you how to get out of your spring. Instead, oh God, you set the seasons. How can I pray for you? Yes, Marilyn. Well, that was pretty interesting too. <laughs> um, that was such a big message. Uh, talk about meat. I feel like I've got a whole meatloaf in front of me. You know, a big square thing that's going to take a while to eat and digest. But the something that really did stand out to me, and you can just pick in one page, is that we have to respond right away or we won't have the seeds to plant. And so if there's no seeds to plant, there will be no harvest. And, and all of the seasons will be barren and askew. And I just was really impressed for the fact that that is not the time to sit back and ponder. That is the time to get up and say, here I am. And also, at the top of my page, 
the temple was finished in the winter so it would stand so God said this has been done to my specifications now it will stand in this winter speaking as a person who's been expecting winter way too long (laughs) 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 I would like I understood that praise God praise God anyone else yes um I don't necessarily like all four seasons. I don't like to be cold, but I realize really must embrace each one because one empowers the other. You have to have the one to go to the next. Without one of them, you're going to really fall short. But um, yes, thank you for that message. There's a lot to chew on and to. to devour yes yes we'll go to ladybug back there and uh, then back up here I just okay I I have always wondered how the virgins kept the oil in their lamp I would always ask God what was the mystery there what was the secret and that's what I got out of your message tonight I want to keep my lamp full and I want to have a spare, you know? Absolutely. Like you were talking about the tanks on your, your truck, your van. Yeah. I know I don't always do everything right, but in my heart, I want to be the bride. Amen. Amen. How many of you have your finger in the hole in the gas tank? <laughs> and fuel's running out? You're afraid? No, Tristan as some things he wants to read off of the net and then we'll bring it up here okay so it's here I realize I am afraid of winter and hope the good lord will deal with my winter with tenderness echo amen to it all Kurt thanks I love what you said about putting things in jars not necessarily at harvest but in summer I know I am in the winter of my life I desperately need to give God permission to break the things. Winter is a time of inner reflection and renewal and maintenance. The other three seasons are glorious, but they are also times of hard work, doing chores, mending fences, cutting grass, etc. Each one of those were separate people. Amen. Terry? Anyone else after Terry? Having been raised on a farm and watching my dad ranch uh and and he was he diversified his crops because if one failed uh he'd have something else that he could draw upon but uh i've seen a full year's work go in and have it rain in the fall and the wheat sprout in the head and the whole the whole crop is gone and uh different things like that happen but i watched my father and (coughs) he uh took it all in a matter of course he he knew things like that happened, and immediately he'd be out taking care of the soil and preparing for the next year, getting the seed and putting it back in again. And I think our Father is like that, um, that he, he will help us to prepare the soil. And if we've had a failed crop, if we pray and get on our knees and ask, that he will help us begin to prepare for another crop, for yes. another season. Yes. I... Uh watched a survival show one time and in there they gave people seed and tools and they were going to build a house and the best family that was supposed to win they did a tally at the last and they built their house and planted their crops and but they never got time to harvest they thought they'd just wait and wait and wait until they had everything done and then go do harvest of the wheat for the animals and, and the oats and stuff like that so the animals could make it through the winter they were finally disqualified that they would not survive because if you leave grass and wheat standing it loses its nutrients and just turns into straw and their animals even though they would have eaten the straw all the protein 70 percent of the protein had already left because they waited too long to harvest food for thought Jackie I had never really seen that in scripture about the the um the virgins about having stores you know it wasn't just that their lamp was full 
they had to have all of that extra too and I I think I've been content with just having it in my lamp and not ha not realizing that I need to go above and beyond just being full myself there's for, you know for whatever reason I need more and um, I just need to I've been kind of pondering what would that look like to have that much more. You know. Amen. Rosalind. I just um, I just want to thank the Lord that He is so faithful to show us, you know, where we where we're lacking and, and it's a hard thing, but it's such a good thing and that He uses everything in our life to <coughs> show us that and to help us to gain the things that we need and um, another thing um, the verse that you read in Revelation um, about um, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire and and ra white raiment uh, it reminded me of a verse um, in Isaiah uh, 55 starting in verse 1 it says every one who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Acli incline your ear, and come to me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Amen. Amen. That's the icing on the cake. Thank you. Anyone else? Last call. I hardly know where to start. I, I can recall years of having no lamp and no oil and no understanding why I needed either. I have seen a man the last two days down in Seattle who not only is in winter but in a perpetual blizzard and I've come to realize this evening listening not just the worship and, and your message but weaknesses I thought were little weaknesses are actually big ones and I'm glad it doesn't just take two days because if it took two days anybody could do it but it takes months and it takes diligence and it takes that time to be broken enough and changed enough, refigured enough to be different than you were. And I'm glad for winter. And I pray that I have enough time to have jars stored when the bride when the groom comes for his bride. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Marilee? This verse about the virgins and the oil always made me kind of nervous. Um, they said the verse about the virgins and the oil always made me kind of nervous because I wasn't quite sure why they didn't have oil. Why would they be silly enough to go without the oil? Where were they supposed to go get it? Why was there not enough time? I've never just been heard a very good explanation of that. And this was the most thorough explanation I've heard that the Lord gives us seasons so that He can produce oil for us. So that if we have vessels to store it up. So it, before I was always just left with, well, how exactly is that going to work and does that include me and where do I fit into this <laughs> and I've never heard an explanation of that with any kind of resolution this seasons thing is an actual resolution in my mind so. and I wonder there's one more time. microphone oh yeah no wonder there's not enough time if it takes seasons to to produce the oil yeah. Carol have a question um, 
I understand that we are the vessel and that part of the the winter is purifying the vessel in order to hold the harvest when it comes. I would submit it, to you that we become the vessel when we take Jesus as our King and Savior. Now okay. there's something that can hold. Go but ahead. But this parable talks about vessels. So what are the other vessels that we could draw from? That's the storehouse of the Holy Spirit, the oil that's kept in jars. We can't contain all the Holy Spirit within us. We can't contain all the essence of God's goodness and His greatness and His provision and His love and His kindness. But we can get jars to store up that <laughs> that can go in our lamp. So th that's the reason why, in my opinion, there are jars there. Remember, uh, uh, one of the prophets uh, told the widow woman to, to get buckets, jars, whatever she could get. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as she could continue to pour, the vessels were filled. I would suggest that that is a, a, a heavy statement to us. We're supposed to be getting everything we can in our lives and going to our neighbors and every place else, getting uh, something to store up all the goodness and richness of the Spirit. Why? Because we'll need it to sustain ourselves. Jackie? Did I answer your question? The other vessels? I would say that they're probably akin to the vessels that uh, Jesus used at the wine, that he turned the water into wine. Those vessels were used for storage. They used the same type of vessels. Uh, they were holy vessels. They used the same type of vessels for oil, too. Uh, ceremonial washing and ceremonial oil. They were stored in those huge 30 to 40 gallon vats, if you want to call them that, pots. Yes, Jackie? It just dawned on me that oil, the oil that they're talking about comes from fruit. You know, because we don't, I don't think about that. I, don't, I think the oil out of the ground or the, you know, petroleum products, but this oil comes from fruit. Yes, it And does. no wonder we need the seasons to develop for this fruit in us. <laughs> so that with the, and I just think of the fruit of the Spirit, which is what we studied in the women's Bible study, how that fruit of the the oil comes from the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Any of you ever go down and get a box of Quaker oatmeal that says instant on it? Well, see, you're supposed to have a storage container filled with the oil so you can be instant in season and out of season. <laughs> Elsewise, there's no instant in season and out of season. <laughs> Pastor, I have a question also. I don't know why it just comes in my spirit. Is, we're talking about storehouse also. Um, isn't that, that like the body of Christ? We're talking about vessels. We're vessels here, and it's kind of like interwoven. Without the body of Christ being interknitted, where would your oil flow from? It, I mean, out of the, you know, not just the Holy Spirit, but my question would you be is the vessels like this, empty chairs, you know, each one of us playing an intricate part. If we're not storing up these things through the Spirit, question to you is would that be another form of storehouse i i think it would be another form of vessels that we could get to store excess oil for us in because if i go to you and i say oh hey i see you got you know your whole basement's empty can i flood it with some oil i have now i know if you're not going through your winter and you're not going through drought there's going to be some oil that I stored remember the lady she went and got the utensils the vessels that belonged to the neighbors to store that in. They loaned her the vessels. She gave them the vessels back when she sold the oil. And my whole point in that is the, the oil is the essence of the Spirit only. It's not our interpersonal relationships. The vessel can be interpersonal relationships. We can get up additional vessels if people have those available. But we're supposed to also have our own. Remember the bride, the virgins had their own. Yeah, they Others that didn't have went to give us some of your oil because they they had that so you you've got to have personal this is something that's personal it begins in my 
estimation with receiving the Holy Spirit. Resistance against that means you got nothing to hold the oil. Uh, well, you got the, you got the lamp. You can hold oil in the lamp, and then you can come and get drink and oh, cry before the Lord, get all emotional before the Lord, and uh, wick kind of burns. Oh, pure light! Oh, this is wonderful. But then you know, a, a day or two goes by, and it's just a smoke again from the wick. It was. It's not a permanent visitation. They were supposed to be. You are supposed to be filled with the Spirit, but we're supposed to have stores of it and planned stores of it. Remember the trip to Florida. You got to plan it. Where are you going to refuel that? We've got life here. How are you going to refuel? Well, God's the one that sets those places of refueling. If you miss the refueling, the filling station is closed. You'll have to wait till it opens again. Could a place of refueling be like corporately? In a corporate Th this is a refueling station right here. This is a place that you can come and buy oil. Go to them who sell oil. I'm selling something. I'm selling you Jesus. I'm selling you oil. And who do you get it from? Him. But right when it comes right off of his... See, it, it, Scripture says that prophecy or in the evangelical world, my old world, we call it inspired preaching, prophecy. We didn't like to even use the word prophet. But you know what the word preacher means in the Old Testament and New Testament? Prophet. <laughs> We won't use that word. <laughs> and that, that different, different, different subject. Sorry, I'm having fun here. Yes, Carol, microphone. In, it was just occurred to me that that a, a healthy Christian, one who is functioning in the spirit, would would keep that cycle of seasons going, so that you're learning from your winters, your you're getting the rain for your springs to grow the crop, to harvest the crop, and then back around and and keep it going. And um, and in the process, you're storing up oil. Absolutely. Along the way. Absolutely. Because you've pressed the olives and you've <laughs> you've yeah. produced the oil. Yeah. And, and we could talk a lot about the extraction process of all the things needed there. No need to even start that process if you're not capable of producing it. And oil is a product of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit if we want to store it up. Uh, any other comments? Last call. Nancy? <coughs> When I first came here, I was definitely a little smoldering, and it was a lot of black stuff, and it wasn't good. I always had understood that once you were filled with the Spirit, you were filled with the Spirit, and that was pretty much it. I'd never understood that you needed to continue to be refilled. Never understood that it needed to be an ongoing, seasonal thing. And... <laughs> The one thing that I like so much about how that you've brought this out is that the price is all of me. And I I have never wanted to embrace that. But I thank the Lord that he has put enough oil into me that I am so willing to embrace that. And he's burnt so much up out of my life and I go, wow, all this is gone and all that's gone. But now what he's doing is he's giving me vessels to store up more. Yes. Not things in this world, but the oil of, that will be needed. Mm. And I praise him and I thank him. This has been such a light to me and such a home to me. Yes. And I rejoice. You know, one thing about the oil, we're going back to the lady that the prophet was there that uh, brought the oil, uh, you know, uh, it multiplied. It was for her and her offspring. They were going to die because of the great famine. Literally, they were really going to die. They were going to, they gave the prophet their last meal, and then they were going to die. God intervened. Which for us, this stores of oil, is, 
have something to do with the future of our children. It's imperative that we receive the Spirit. It's imperative that we get filled with the Spirit. It's imperative that we continue to flow in the Spirit so that our children, it brings life to them. So there's there's a whole other measure, too, that has to do with the vessels, you know, connecting it to the woman in the Old Testament, the vessels. Uh, I, you know, I could do a whole sermon just about the different vessels and all the things they affect. Closing comment, anyone? Last call? Going, going, gone? Shall we pray? Lord, your great word sweeps over us with great swells. Some of it past our own understanding. But, oh, Lord, let it drift back where we can grab hold of it and hang on to it and store it in our lives. Lord, we need more of your Spirit. And I'm sure there's someone listening out there that maybe has not even received the infilling of your Spirit yet, just has the lamp and the wick. Father, I lift them to you. Show them out of your justice and your counsel that you have rendered a great decision for us on our behalf that we be filled with your Holy Spirit. Not resistors of it, not questioners of it, but that we come and are obedient to you. Help them in their obedience. Help them in their understanding. Not only to come to that conclusion, but to carry it out in its finality by getting in the position to receive I have a car that has a gas tank. I have to go to a gas pump, take off the gas cap in order to put gas in. So help me, O oh God, to come into your storehouse of fresh oil and fill my tank and fill these, your people, our tanks fresh. And Teach us, O oh Lord, to carry extra gas cans. In Jesus' name, amen. May God richly bless you if you can help put up the fort. One Remember to, to remember at 1 o'clock tomorrow.